Hey guys, this is Benji Johnson from Earth Tones Recording Studio, and today we're gonna learn how to mic up some drums. So today we're going to take things about as basic as we can. I have a four-piece Reverie drum kit with a kick drum, snare drum, a rack mounted tom, a floor tom, one crash cymbal, one rod cymbal, and a pair of hi-hats. We're going to mic these up with six microphones. It's one microphone on the kick drum, one microphone on the snare drum, one microphone on the rack tom, and one microphone on floor tone. Well, I said six mics, right? So there's a pair of overheads. Most times when you mic up a drum kit with a pair of overhead microphones, the overhead microphones are pretty much a stereo picture of the drum kit from above or above sometimes in what's called an XY pattern, or I have them set up differently today going to set them up today in what they call the Glenn Johns pattern. It was a producer, engineer, Glenn Johns, way back in the day. Google him. Google's your friend today. He would mic up a drum kit with a pair of either stereo condensers. I'm using ribbon mics today. And the way that he would do his overheads is he would put one overhead over the snare drum, and he would put one behind the floor tom. And we'd also use a kick drum mic. That would be the only three microphones on the drum kit. So... Today, I am using that technique. And the microphones that I'm using for each drum, I'll talk about right now. So the best place to explain the kick drum is actually down here at the kick drum. So, miking a kick drum is not as simple as it seems. There's a wee bit of science behind it. The kick drum has a head on the front of it, and it has a head on the back of it. When you kick the kick drum on that side, the head on this side moves. Just like that. So, today we have one microphone that we're going to use to mic up the kick drum. The kick drum, lucky for me, has a hole in it. If you look at this hole and the edge of it. When the kick drum is kicked, the head moves just like this. There's a diaphragm inside this microphone. When the air coming out of this hole hits the diaphragm of the microphone, it also moves. I have read and had explained to me that if you want the kick drum to be as true sounding on the microphone as it sounds coming out of the drum, if you can line up the front of the kick drum head with the diaphragm inside the microphone so they're both on the same plane that you will get as true of a kick drum sound as you can with one microphone. That's the way it's been explained to me. But just like everything else with drums, the other thing that you're going to learn is it's not necessarily all about the drum. It's most of the time about the player. So, today, with one microphone, we're going to position this kick drum mic to where I know the diaphragm is about right here, so it's right on the same plane with the front head of the kick drum. So when the kick drum head moves, the microphone diaphragm moves. I'm using a Lewitt, I think this is a 340 Rex is what it's called. Really killer kick drum mic, check them out. I'll see you at the snare drum. Now let's talk about the snare drum. In certain instances, you're going to use one microphone or two microphones on this drum. Today, we're going to use one microphone. When using two microphones on the snare drum, you will mic one on the top and you will mic one underneath. The one underneath will need to be flipped 
out of phase. When you flip it out of phase at the source, the microphone preamp, that means that as both heads on the snare drum move when it's hit, the microphones won't see them both moving away from each other. Does that make sense? When you hit this top head, this mic sees it going away. The bottom mic sees the bottom head. When you hit the top head, the bottom head goes down. Top head goes down, bottom head goes down. So when you flip those mics out of phase, that actually makes them see the, see the heads moving as they should instead of opposite of each other, which makes them sound out of phase. But today we're miking with one microphone. So the way that I mic up with only one microphone is a little unconventional. Most of the time you're gonna see a microphone pointed kind of like this at a snare drum. It'll be here, but it'll be pointed like this, right? Over the drum, pointing towards the middle of the drum. To me, when I want one microphone or I only have the luxury of using one mic, say you have a kick mic and a snare mic and an overhead mic, and that's all you have for the whole drum kit. But I do not want to lose the ability to hear the snares on the bottom of the snare drum, right? It's called a snare drum. I wanna hear those things. So if I don't have the luxury of putting a separate mic on the bottom of the drum, I wanna position this microphone to where it hears a little bit of both, but it picks up the top head like you would. To me, in my experience, normally if I use one microphone on the snare drum and I put it over the drum, the first thing I'm doing is I'm creating a barrier between this microphone and the snares on the bottom of the drum with the drum itself. Makes a lot of sense. So, also, I mean, when you do this, you, you will spend hours and hours and hours learning. If you can be reading for classes, you'll be reading the internet, you'll be reading, you know, magazines, you'll be reading trades, uh, books, all kinds of stuff. But you will see, you know, interviews with people who mic things differently than say, you're used to miking them. So what I do with a snare drum is, if I have one microphone, I have read that if I have it looking directly across the snare drum, just like my eyeballs looking directly across the head of this drum, I want the microphone looking directly across. I had it explained to me, two pencil widths back from the edge. Now my fingers are a little bigger than pencils, so two pencil widths back and literally looking straight across the drum. The two pencil widths back actually lets it come out here to the edge and pick up a little bit of the snares off the bottom because you're not creating a barrier with the drum between the microphone and the bottom of the drum. So you'll kind of hear that today. There are some ups and downs with the way, uh, you know, with using that. There's some positives and negatives, but depending on the drummer, most of the time, you're going to catch a good, solid snare drum signal, you know, and the mic is going to be kind of back enough to actually give you a little bit of air, a little bit of, you get a little mercy from the drum. It's not just in the mic all the time. So that's the way we're going to mic the snare drum today. Our rack tom and floor tom mics are pretty simple. I have the Lewitt Tom microphone, which mounts to this nifty clip. The clip clips on the edge of the drum. Some people don't like to use clips, and sometimes I don't like to use clips. But today, we're going to use clips because as you can see, when this drum moves, the microphone moves with it. The only downside of these is if you have a drum that has a really bad resonant frequency in the drum, sometimes they can make your, make your microphone resonate too because your microphone is not decoupled from the drum. That's a preference. Sometimes you can use stands, sometimes you can use clips. Today, I'm using clips. These Lewitt mics, incredible. So, I have one on the rack time and I have one over here on the floor time which you can't see, but I'll show it to you in a minute. Now, let's talk about our stereo overhead microphones. There's one over the snare drum. There's one behind the floor tom. That is exactly where I want them. When I look at the drum kit from this side, I want this microphone pan to the right. When I look at the microphone from this side also, this, 
look at the drum kit from this side also. This microphone is going to be panned to the left. I prefer to pan my drums from what is called listener perspective. There are two different ways you can pan your drums in post. One is drummer perspective. In other words, as the drummer sits behind the drum kit, I look at these drums and I pan them all in my pan spectrum as if I was the drummer. Kick drum is up the middle. Snare drum is normally for me up the middle. Rack tom would be a little bit to the left. The floor tom would be over here. And these overheads would be panned hard left for here and hard right. I don't know about you, but the last time that I went to a concert, I never listened to it from behind the drum kit. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever listened to a band play from behind the drummer. Therefore, I never quite understood why people mixed the drum kit from a drummer perspective, but that's up for debate. And it's always up for debate on the good old internet. If you pan drums the way that I do, you're going to pan them from what's called audience perspective. Meaning that if I turn myself around and I'm looking at the drum kit from back here, this microphone is going to be panned right. This microphone is going to be panned left. My kick and snare are still gonna be up the middle, this tom microphone is going to be panned a little bit right, and this floor tom is going to be panned a little left. You want to make sure that you document all of these either by writing them down or by snapping a picture of some kind or just knowing how you mic drums all the time. Because when you go to mix, you don't want to accidentally mix up the panning on these and say my floor tom. I have a floor tom microphone and then I have an overhead that's but not an overhead, but I have a stereo mic that's right behind the floor tom. If I pan them opposite or get them not in the right, your drum picture is just going to sound like slop and it's not going to be great. So remember that. So these overheads, overheads, sometimes might be right here pointing down and that's perfectly fine. Sometimes they might be right here in an XY pattern. Today, I'm putting these in the Glenn Johns pattern, as I mentioned earlier. The Glenn Johns pattern is essentially one over the snare drum and one behind the floor tom. But the way that I'm doing it today, you have to measure. And when you measure with a measuring tape, which I had in my pocket, but I don't have right now, this measures 36 inches from the top of the snare drum. This microphone also measures 36 inches from the snare drum. Measuring out microphones will make your life much easier. You can measure out the distance that your overheads are apart. You can measure the distance that they are from the floor. You can measure the distance that they are from the ceiling. It all depends on what you're kind of wanting to get them away from. Like these, you'll notice I have them lower. These are figure eight microphones. They're ribbons. They pick up on this side and on this side. They don't pick up on this side. These are called null points. So this is going to pick up really great here, but it's also equally going to pick up up here. If you notice, I have a big baffle hanging up there, right? I don't want to hear a ton of my ceiling in this microphone. I would rather hear more of the snare drum. Also with this microphone, you're going to notice this one behind the floor tom is going to pick up a really nice picture here of this. Some of the kick, some of this. It's going to pick up the ride cymbal really great. But behind it, I have a baffle because I don't want it to be picking up the brick wall back there. I would rather it be picking up more of a dead spot. Your room is very key in all of this. You'll notice when I pull the recordings of these drums up in the control room later on that I could take the kick drum mic and I could take this pair of overheads and pull them up and they would sound magnificent if the record that I was cutting really catered to having a very simple drum sound like that and it wasn't a bombast of layers of instruments I could probably make that work and I may be able to make it work in in any circumstance but you have to start with good microphones these are Cole's 4038 ribbon microphones they are no joke they are expensive but they sound amazing you get what you pay for in that instance so you can check those out but if you don't have the money to buy a pair of Cole's Go get a pair of affordable microphones. Put them in a stereo pattern. Your stereo, your stereo microphones are really, besides the individual drum mics, they're picking up the, the everything of the drum kit. They're a stereo picture of the whole drum kit. 
You really want to hear how your drummer plays? Then pull up the stereo mics. You'll be amazed. Sometimes drummers will play, you know, their dynamics aren't that great, and you'll hear it in the overhead. Sometimes a drummer plays and he mixes himself at the drum kit, which makes for a really easy day. When you pull these up, you'll hear that. Sounds amazing. You could literally use them in the whole, the whole mix. So now that we've talked about why we put these microphones where we did and what we're going to do with them, we're going to have a little, have a little playing and we're going to go into the control room and we're going to kind of listen and see what these things sound like. And if certain things don't sound the way that I want them to from initially setting up these microphones and measuring them out, then instead of recording it on that end and fixing it on that side of the wall, you can't see my control room wall, but I have two philosophies. I have, <laughs> I have two philosophies. I can either fix it on that side of the wall, which is in my control room later, or I can fix it on this side of the wall. And as I grow older, and as I gain more experience doing this on a daily basis, I learned that my life and your life will also be much easier when you fix the drum kit on this side of the wall. Meaning that if a drum sounds bad, if something's not in tune, if, if, if something is too close to a microphone, if when I hit this cymbal, if all I hear in my rack tom mic is this cymbal, then I probably need to address it on this end of the wall, right? this side of the wall. I need to fix it with the drummer. I need to talk to him about maybe how he plays. I need to fix it at the drum kit, maybe some muffling. You'll notice with this snare drum that I have three of these gels on the drum. If I take them all off and I listen to all of them with no gels on them. So the gels that I keep on the drum, I keep them on the drum because they make the drum sound less ringy. When I hit the drum without it, You hear that pitch goes, bum, bum. I don't want that. Because every time the drummer hits that, I'm going to hear that. Now, I could do two things. I could put a gel on it and hit it again. No backside ring. That's good. Now, what if it's still too much? Let's put another gel on it. That's still got like a little car horn sounding thing in it. I'm going to put this gel on it. Perfect. Now, I fixed the drum on this side of the wall. Instead of recording it in a way that I knew wouldn't work and having to fix it in the mix. I spent a lot of years fixing in the mix. It's not a lot of fun when you know that all you have to do is come out here and fix it. There's a million drum kits. There's a million drummers. There's a million drums. There's a million ways you can fix these things. So. As an engineer, if you do not play drums, you have to learn about drums. And you have to learn just enough about them to be dangerous, but you have to learn how to make them sound good. And if they sound bad, how to fix them to not sound bad. Anyway, so we're going to record some of this drum kit the way that we mic'd it up, then we're going to go in there and listen. Stay tuned. Okay, so now we're back in the control room. We're going to pull these drums in one drum at a time. So I'm going to talk on my talkback mic to my drummer, and I'm going to tell him to play the kick drum. All right, give me a little kick drum. All right, so you'll notice my Neve mic preamps, the Ventec 473s that have a gain and a volume. I have the volume all the way up, I have the gain all the way down. I have them patched into the appropriate place I need them to patch. And then we're going to go to the screen. And I'm going to show you where the kick drum is. All right, let me hear the kick drum. One more time. Aha. There it is. So I'm going to label this kick. And then I'm going to unmute it. And we're going to take a listen to it. Kick again. It's kind of knocky sounding. That's okay. Let me hear it again. So 
So it needs a little more level. I'm going to turn the gain up one notch. Kick again. Good. Now, I'm noticing that my kick drum needs a little top end. So I'm going to turn the EQ on. And then I'm going to turn the 12K up just a bit. Kick drum again. Ah, oh, I can hear that's a good difference. I'm going to take the 60 on the kick drum and turn it up a little bit. One more time. That's good. I can feel that there's plenty of low end. So now we're going to go to the snare drum. Snare drum. Snare's not bad. So it already has a little EQ on it, which I'm going to cut off. Snare drum again. That's good. I like it. So I'm going to turn the gain a little more up on the snare mic. You hear it again? can see from my snare level coming into my monitoring software, it's going to print at a pretty good level. One more time. I'm going to add a little bit of top, a little bit of mids at like 3.2K, not too top endy. All right. One more time. Good. That's perfect. Perfect. All right, let me hear the rack tom. Not bad. Not a bad drum sound. Hit it again. The rack tom's a little booby, a little bit, and it has EQ on it from a previous session. So I'm going to turn this EQ off, and I'm going to cut a little bit of the low end on the rack tom. Again. I think that's pretty good. I've cut a little of the 60 so it's not so boomy. And now I'm going to have them check the floor tom. Alright, hit the floor tom. Hit it nice and hard. One more time. All right, that's good. That's good. Now, the fun part starts. So we're gonna get to the overheads. So we're gonna take these overheads and we're gonna pan them hard left and hard right. This is in my UA console monitoring software. And now we're going to hear the overheads. All right. All right. Play the whole drum kit for me. Just a beat, kick, snare, and hi-hat. So we're going to solo our overheads out. Take a listen to that. I like those. I can see that the meters are not jumping too much on the inputs. So I'm going to give a little bit more level. Keep playing, please, till I say to stop. It's good. I'm going to turn these overheads up where I get a good... I have a green, yellow, and a red meter. I'm going to go green. I'm going to go into the yellow a little bit with them. I don't want them to be too much. And I don't want the gain on them to be so hot that it's sucking the whole room. Want him to catch the drum kit. That's good. So now we're going to put the overheads back into the mix. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 wow. All 
All right, good. So now we're gonna print him a little bit into Pro Tools. And you'll notice in Pro Tools that I just have six channels set up. I have them set up kick snare, rack floor, overhead right, and overhead left. So I'm gonna turn on my kick mic and I'm gonna see that I have signal into it. Turn on my snare mic, see that I have signal into it. Floor time signal, overhead left, overhead right. All right. Now, as you'll see, I'm already in Pro Tools and I'm monitoring in Pro Tools. But I'm going to hit record quickly just so I can print a little bit of the signal. And I can look at my levels. So my meters give me a good level. Sometimes your meters and your print level are very deceiving. So I like to just print a little bit of just the drummer playing in general as I watch. And what I'm looking for a lot of times is I'm looking for kick and snare bleed on my tom mics. And you can see here that it looks pretty good so far. It almost looks like no signal on the kit on the rack and floor from what I can tell is being printed but the levels are pretty low over here on the meters. I can tell that. So, it's okay. Everything's looking good. Snare drum could use a little more level coming in, I think, but I think it's a good, I think it's a good level to start. I'm gonna turn up the gain knob on the kick and the snare drum one more time. And you're gonna see that that's gonna give me a little bit more level print. It sounds good. You're also going to see down here that. Okay, thank you. You're also going to see down here that as we print the overheads, you're going to see that the right overhead has a lot of snare signal in it because remember, it's the one that was over the snare drum, and the other one is behind the floor tom. So the uh, this overhead. The right overhead you're going to see, and I'm showing you on the screen right now, is picking up a lot more. So as we listen back to those tracks, you'll be able to hear a little bit of that. That's everything at Unity Gain. Pull the overheads down a little bit. Everything dries up a bit. Take my rack time, pan it off, take my floor time, pan it kind of where I want to, and I have my stereo overhead picture. Sounds amazing. So, that should be drum print and drum sound 101. Now that we've got them printed, Let's see what other kind of mix tricks we can possibly do with them. All right, guys. So here we go. We're going to learn a few mix tricks on what I do with drums and a couple of the tricks that you can do. So you're going to notice that I have kick, snare, rack, floor, overheads. We can the first the first thing we you know we can do is we can add a little reverb. That is pretty easy, but most guys are going to insert it on the channel, and I don't like to insert reverb on the channel because then I'm at the mercy of the actual sound of the plugin. And if I have a cheap reverb plugin, then my whole snare sound that I just worked, you know, 20 minutes to get. Uh, actually doesn't takes on the sound of a ten dollar plug-in so what i will do is i will bust it out to an aux so i'll take an aux and you'll see me take this aux input and i'll put a reverb plug in i have the lexicon 224 reverb here from universal audio um i will make the reverb input call it drum verb. Now, I'll take my snare drum and I will send it out 
to the drum verb. And I'll turn it up. All right. And now we have a little drum verb. I don't know how much of that you can hear. But I'm going to actually make the stems of this uh, session available so you guys can download them and take a listen to that. And what I'll do is I'll make one with the verb and all the different stuff I do. So that's super easy mix trick number one. You guys watching this probably all know that already. But I do like to use uh, auxes for my effects, for delays and things like that, because it lets me keep the integrity of the dry drum signal. Um, and add the reverb to that. So I have a dry and a wet. Instead of a dry and a wet blend on the plug-in, I have a dry and a wet, uh, the dry drum signal, and then I have the actual aux that has 100% wet reverb on it. And so if I'm in a mix, I don't have to go into a plug-in and start dialing wet and dry on it, you know, and all that. Plus the levels on plug-ins are just really weird. They mess with my whole drum picture. So the drum picture on this sounds pretty good dry. So instead of adding a reverb, let's say I make that reverb inactive. I'm going to show you another way to add your own ambience to your drum kit. And that is basically you can do something called parallel compression. And I'm going to take these overheads that I did, the, the two ribbon mics that we did that was one over the snare and one behind the floor tom. We're going to listen to those. I'm going to solo those out and just listen to just those two mics. Sounds pretty good. Just those two mics, they sound killer, right? Now, you can hear that there's a good bit of the room in those mics. So I'm going to cut those off and then I'm going to take uh, my overhead signal and I'm going to bus it out to a bus that I am going to call drum overhead bus. So you'll notice I pulled in two stereo aux channels into Pro Tools or whatever your DAW of choice is. And I pulled that into Pro Tools, and then what I'm going to do is take these overheads that have a good amount of the room in them, right? And we're going to leave one of those stereo buses dry, so you just have a bus, a stereo bus, which is just an aux input into Pro Tools. So in other words, I'm making a master fader for just my two overhead mics, and it's still in stereo with them panned hard left and hard right. You'll see that my stereo, my you'll see that my drum mics are panned hard left and hard right. They get sent out to the aux called drum overhead bus. The input of this aux is drum overhead bus. Therefore, when I play it, you're gonna see that my sound of my overheads come all the way down and all the way up with that one fader. All right. Now, you're going to notice that I put another fader in that has the same exact input. So now I have two faders with the same exact thing coming into the mix, the drum overheads. Well, on the second fader, I'm going to take a compressor plug-in. And you can take a really basic compressor plug-in like an 1176. I think that uh, I think the Pro Tools even has a basic 1176 like this one. I'll put that one in, you know, instead of showing off a bunch of expensive plugins. If you don't have them, these will work just fine too. So what you want to do is I'll take the ratio on that plugin and I'll just take it up to like 20 to one, which is really extreme. And then I'll watch it. And I'll watch the input of it. And as I start to push the input, you're going to see this needle go way down here. And I'm going to make the attack really fast and I'm going to make the release really slow. So in other words, what happens is this needle is going to come down there and it's just going to get buried 
and it's not going to go anywhere. So in other words, that compressor is going to grab on to that drum signal and it's not going to let it go. That means that your natural room acoustics are not really going to come into play. You're pretty much going to be like, you're, you're just going to hear everything sucked into those microphones with this. And you'll hear it now that we do this. Uh, I'll push it up some more. And then I'll just turn it up. So now it sounds like I have a good amount of reverb on my drum kit, but I don't. That's just nothing but these two overhead mics sent into. Now, you can get even more extreme. You can take that plug in out and you can use something like the uh, Sound Toys Decapitator, which is just killer. And it does exactly what it says it's going to do. It just totally decapitates the sound. So it's a distortion generator and it's really cool. So I'll take it and I'll just turn up the drive. part about this plugin is it has what's called a punish knob. So when you put the punish knob in, it's extreme. I love it. So what you can do is you can actually take that really distorted crushed drum sound put it into your regular drum sound just like that so I have an overhead that has I have a bus that has the clean overheads on it and I have one that has the ones that are just super crushed you can play around with some of that you can add EQ to that But you would be amazed at how much distortion and crazy compression tricks can do to a drum sound. All right, so I think today that that's going to be the extent of our drum tutorial. If there are any questions, I think we should have about 10, 15 minutes to uh, talk about things. There are a million things that I didn't even delve into. If there's any part of this that I, you feel like I skipped over something or I explained something and I didn't go back to it in post, then... Uh, feel free to ask me in the uh, upcoming question and answer. I will make all these uh, stems available to download if I can't get them uh, to the um, to the site, to a link that you can download, then basically we can, uh, I can make a link for you and I can send them to you. So you guys have a good day. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Benji Johnson. This is Earth Tones Recording Studio and I appreciate you talking.